You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is Lecture 9, given on August 30th, 1919, of the Lecture Cycle by Rudolf Steiner, Practical Advice to Teachers. The children coming to the Waldorf School will be of widely differing ages. When we start the lessons in the different classes, we shall have to take particular account of this age range, and we must also not lose sight of another related point. Unfortunately, we cannot immediately found a university with all the usual faculties to continue from the point where the Waldorf School leaves off. It will be up to us to prepare our students for the other institutes of further education that they will have to attend when they leave the Waldorf School and before they step out into life. We must provide our students by the time they leave with the necessary qualifications for whatever further education will be suitable for them when they go out into life. We shall achieve our aim and accomplish our task despite the need to conform to these restrictions if we can put into practice the educational principles we have established in the present cultural epoch of humankind's development. We shall be able to achieve this aim, particularly with regard to the older children who will soon have to be sent away to the other institutions of life, only if we apply a golden rule to teach economically. We shall be able to teach economically, particularly particularly the 13, 14, and 15-year-olds, if we carefully eliminate everything that is merely ballast for human soul development at that age and can bear no fruits for life. For instance, we shall have to make room in our timetable at least for Latin and possibly also for Greek. We must, in any case, really come to grips with language teaching, for this will be a most significant feature of our method as a whole. Let us look at the fact that you will be teaching students who will already have been taught French or Latin up to a certain stage. Their lessons will have been conducted in a certain way. You will have to spend your first lesson or even your first week finding out what they already know. You will have to repeat with them what they have done so far, but you must do so judiciously so that each, according to his or her capacity, will benefit from this repetition. You will achieve a great deal simply by taking into account that what delays you more than anything else in teaching foreign languages is translation from the foreign language into the mother tongue and vice versa. An enormous amount of time is wasted when, for instance, so much translation from Latin into Greek, excuse me, from Latin into German and from German back into Latin is expected of grammar school students. Instead, there should be much more reading and the students should spend much more time expressing their own thoughts in the foreign language. How then will you set about teaching a foreign language, let us say French, on the basis of this rule? Let us first consider the older children to whom this will apply, those who are thirteen and fourteen. For them you will first have to select carefully what you want to read in a particular language, select passages for reading, and then call on the students one by one to read them aloud. You will save their time and energy if you do not begin by insisting that they translate the passages into German, but instead make sure that each child reads properly in terms of pronunciation and so on. In the classes, when you want to review work and cover new material, it is still good not to require translation, but to let the students give a free rendering of the content in the passage they have read. Just allow children to repeat in their own words what the passage says while you listen carefully for any omissions that might indicate that they have not understood the excerpt. It is more convenient for you, of course, simply to let the children translate, for then you soon see where one of them cannot go on. It is less expeditious to listen for something to be omitted, instead of just waiting until the child comes to a stop, but you can nevertheless find out by this means whether something has not been understood, if a phrase is not rendered correctly in the mother tongue. There will be children who make a very capable rendering of the passage and others whose rendering is much freer in the use of their own words. This does not matter. This is the way we should discuss the text with the children. Next we tackle the opposite procedure. First we discuss a subject with the children in their mother tongue, a subject that they can follow along with us in their thoughts and feelings. Then we can try to let the children repeat freely depending on how far advanced they already are 
in the foreign language what we have been discussing with them. In this way we shall discover how well these children, who have come to us from all sorts of classes, know the foreign language. You cannot teach a foreign language in school without really working at grammar, both ordinary grammar and syntax. It is particularly necessary for children older than twelve to be made conscious of what lies in grammar, but here too you can proceed very circumspectly. This morning in our study of the human being I said that in ordinary life we form conclusions and then proceed to judgment and concept. Footnote see Lecture 9, The Foundations of Human Experience. End footnote. <clears throat> Although you cannot present the children directly with this logical method, it will underlie your teaching of grammar, particularly with the help of the lessons in foreign languages. You will do well to discuss matters of the world with the children in a way that will allow grammar lessons to arise organically. It is purely a matter of structuring such a thing properly. Start by shaping a complete sentence and not more than a sentence. Point to what is going on outside. At this very moment you would have an excellent example. You could very well combine grammar with a foreign language by letting the children express in Latin and French and German, for example, quote, it is raining, unquote. Start by eliciting from the children the statement, quote, it is raining, unquote. Then point out to them, they are, after all, older children, that they are expressing a pure activity when they say, it rains. Now you can proceed to another sentence. You can include, if you like, foreign languages, for you will save a great deal of time and energy if you also work this method into the foreign language lesson. You say to the children, quote, instead of the scene outside in the rain, imagine to yourselves a meadow in springtime. Unquote. Lead the children until they say of that meadow, quote, it is greening, it greens, unquote. and then take them further until they transform the sentence, quote, it is greening, into the sentence, the meadow is greening, excuse me. And finally, lead them still further until they can transform the sentence, quote, the meadow is greening, unquote, into the concept of a, quote, green meadow, unquote. If you stimulate these thoughts within the children, one after the other in your language lessons, you will not be pedantically teaching them syntax and logic. You will be guiding the whole soul constellation of these children in a certain direction. You will be teaching them in a discreet way what should arise in their souls. You introduce sentences beginning, quote, it, unquote, or, quote, it is, unquote, to the children. Sentences that really live only in the domain of activity and exist as sentences in themselves without any subject or predicate. <clears throat> These are sentences that belong to the living realm of conclusions. They are indeed abbreviated conclusions. With an appropriate example, you take the further step of finding a subject, quote, the meadow greens, unquote, or, quote, the meadow that is green, unquote. Here you have taken the step of forming a judgment sentence. You will agree that it will be difficult to construct a similar judgment sentence for the sentence, quote, it rains, unquote. Where would you find the subject for it rains? It is not possible. By practicing in this way with the children, you enter linguistic realms about which philosophers have written a great deal. Miklosik, the scholar of Sl Slavic languages, started writing about sentences without subjects, followed by Brentano, and then Marty in Prague, footnote, Franz Zaver von Miklosik, 1831-1891, a Slavic philologist, I'm, I'm thinking that's the word philologist, and professor in Vienna, considered founder of modern Slavic philology. Franz Brentano, 1838-1917, German philosopher, Roman Catholic priest, and professor in Würzburg and Vienna, wrote on, quote, act psychology. Unquote, or intentionalism, as well as on Aristotle, Anton Marty, and then, and then there is next one, Anton Marty, 1847-1942, was a, excuse me, let me read his dates again, 1847-1914, was a student of Brentano. <clears throat> End of footnote. They all sought to find the rules connected with subject-less sentences, such as, it rains, it snows, it lightens, it thunders, and so on, for out of their logic they could not understand where sentences without subjects originated. Sentences without subjects, as a matter of fact, arise from the very intimate links we have with the world in some aspects, in some respects. Human beings are a microcosm, 
embedded in a macrocosm, and their activity is not separated from the activity of the world. When it rains, for instance, we are very closely linked with the world, particularly if we have no umbrella. We cannot separate ourselves from it, and we get just as wet as the pavements and houses around us. In such a case we do not separate ourselves from the world, we do not invent a subject but name only the activity. Where we can be somewhat more detached from the world, where we can more easily remove ourselves from it, as in the case of the meadow, there we can invent a subject for our sentence, quote, the meadow is greening, unquote. From this example you see that in the way we speak to the children we can always take account of the interplay between the human being and the environment. By presenting the children, particularly in the lessons devoted to foreign languages, with examples in which grammar is linked to the practical logic of life, we try to discover how much they know of grammar and syntax. <clears throat> but in the foreign language lessons, please avoid first working through a reading passage and subsequently pulling the language to pieces. Make every effort to develop the grammatical side independently. There was a time when foreign language textbooks contained fantastic sentences that took account only of the proper application of grammatical rules. Gradually this came to be regarded as ridiculous and sentences taken more from life were included in foreign language textbooks instead. But here too, the middle path is better than the two extremes. If you use only sentences from ordinary life, you will not be able to teach pronunciation very well unless you also use sentences like the ones we spoke yesterday as an exercise. For instance, lulling, leader, limply, liplessly laughing, loppity, lumpity, lackety, lout. Footnote, see beginning of Discussion 8 in Discussions with Teachers. This version was adapted for English speakers from the original, I'll give it a try, quote, lalle, leader, lieblich, lieblicher, laffer, lappiger, lumpiger, leichiger, luach. End of footnote. <laughs> These sentences consider only the essence of language. When you develop grammar and syntax with the children, you will have to wake up sentences specifically, excuse me, you will have to make up sentences specifically to illustrate this or that grammatical rule. But you will have to see to it that the children do not write down these sentences illustrating grammatical rules. Instead of being written down in their notebooks, they should be worked on. They come into being, but they are not preserved. This procedure contributes enormously to the economical use of your lessons, particularly foreign language lessons, for in this way the children absorb the rules in their feelings and, have a, and after a while drop the examples. If they are allowed to write down the examples, they absorb the form of the example too strongly. In terms of teaching grammar, the examples ought to be dispensable. They should not be carefully written down in notebooks, for only the rule should finally remain. It is beneficial to use exercises and reading passages for the living language, for actual speech, and on the other hand to let the children formulate their own thoughts in the foreign language, using more the kind of subject that crops up in daily life. For, for grammar, however, you use sentences that from the start you intend the children to forget, and therefore you do not let them do what is always helpful in memorizing, write them down. All the activity involved in teaching the children grammar and syntax with the help of sentences takes place in living conclusions. It should not descend into the dreamlike state of habitual actions, but should continue to play in fully conscious life. Naturally, this method introduces into the lessons an element that makes teaching somewhat strenuous. But you can not avoid the fact that you will have to make a certain effort particularly in the lessons with the students who come into the older classes, you will have to proceed very economically, and yet this economy will actually benefit only the students. You yourselves will, will need to spend a great deal of time inventing all the techniques that will help make the lessons as spare as possible. By and large, then, let grammar and syntax lessons be conversational. It is not a good idea to give children actual books of grammar and syntax in the form in which they exist today. They also contain examples, but examples on the whole should be discussed and not written. Only the rules should be written down in the notebooks the children use for learning regular grammar and syntax. It will be exceedingly economical, and you will also do the children an enormous amount of good if on one day you discuss a particular rule of grammar in a language with the help of an example you have invented. Then the next day, or the day after that, you return to this rule in the same language lesson 
and let the children use their own imaginations to find an example. Do not underestimate the educational value of such a method. Teaching is very much a matter of subtleties. It is vastly different whether you merely question children on a rule of grammar and let them repeat from their notebooks the examples you have dictated, or whether you make up examples specially intended to be forgotten and then ask the children to find their own examples. This activity is immensely educational. Even if you have in your class the worst young scamps who never pay any attention at all, you will soon see what happens when you set them the task of finding examples to fit a rule of syntax, and you can indeed succeed if you yourself are fully alert as you teach. They will start to take pleasure in these examples. They will especially enjoy the activity of making them up themselves. When the children come back to school after the long summer holidays, having played out of doors for weeks on end, you will have to realize that they will have little inclination to sit quietly in class and listen attentively to things that they are expected to remember. Even if you find this behavior behavior rather disturbing during the first week or two, if you conduct your lessons, particularly the foreign language lessons, in a way that lets the children share in the sole activity of making up examples, You will discover among them, after three or four weeks, a number who enjoy making up such examples just as much as they enjoyed playing outdoors. But you too must take care to make up examples and not hesitate to make the children aware of this. Once they have gotten into the swing of this activity, it is very good if the children want to go on and on. It might happen that while one is giving an example, another calls out, I have one too, and then then they all want a turn to share their examples. It is then helpful if you say at the end of the lesson, quote, I am very pleased that you, are, that you like doing this just as much as you enjoyed romping outdoors. Unquote. Such a remark echoes within the children. They carry it with them all the way home from school and tell it to their parents at dinner. You really must say things to the children that they will want to tell their parents at the next meal. And if you succeed in interesting them so much that they ask their mothers or fathers to make up an example for this rule, you really have carried off the prize. You can achieve such successes if you throw yourself heart and soul into your teaching. Just consider what a difference it makes if you discuss with the children in a spirited way the process forming, quote, it rains, unquote, quote, it greens, quote, unquote, <coughs> excuse me, quote, the meadow is greening, unquote, and, quote, the green meadow, unquote, instead of developing grammar and syntax in the usual way. You would not point out that this is an adjective and this is a verb and that if a verb stands alone there is no sentence. In short, you would not piece things together in the way that is often done in grammar books. Instead, you would develop the theme in a lively lesson. Compare this living way of teaching grammar with the way it is so often taught today. The Latin or French teacher comes into the classroom. The children get out their Latin or French books. They have finished their homework and now they are to translate. Afterward, they will read. Soon all their bones ache because the seats are so hard. If proper teaching methods were practiced, there would be no need to take such care in designing chairs and desks. The fact that so much care has had to be lavished on the making of seats and desks is proof that education has not been conducted sensibly. If children are really taken up in their lessons, the class is so lively that even if they are sitting down, they do not sit firmly. We should be delighted if our children do not sit down firmly, for only those who are themselves sluggish want a class of children to remain firmly seated, after which they drag themselves home, aching in every limb. Particular account must be taken of these matters in grammar and syntax lessons. Imagine that the children now have to translate. Grammar and syntax are worked out from the very things of life they ought to be enjoying. Afterward, they are most unlikely to go home and say to their fathers, quote, We're reading such a lovely book, let's do some translating together. Unquote. It really is important not to lose sight of the principle of economy. It will serve you particularly well in your teaching of foreign languages. <coughs> we must see to it, of course, that our teaching of grammar and syntax is fairly complete. <coughs> we shall have to discover the gaps in the previous experience of the students who are coming to us from all sorts of other classes. Our first task will be to close the gaps, particularly in grammar and syntax, so that after a few weeks we shall have brought a class to a stage where we can proceed. If we teach in the way I have described, and we are quite capable of doing so if we are totally involved in the lessons and if we ourselves are interested in them, we shall be giving the children what they will need 
to enable them to pass the usual college entrance examinations later on. And we impart to the children a great deal else that they would not receive in ordinary elementary or secondary schools, lessons that make them strong for life and that will serve them throughout life. It would be particularly beneficial in teaching foreign languages if the lessons are organized so that they allow the various languages that children must learn to coexist. At enormous, excuse me, an enormous amount of time is lost when children of 13, 14, and 15 are taught Latin by one teacher, French by another, and English by a third. Very much is gained when one teacher develops a thought with a student in one language, then that same thought is developed by another teacher in another language, and so on. One language thus abundantly supports the other. Of course, this can be accomplished only when the necessary resources are available, teachers in this case. Whatever is available should be utilized fully. The support that one language gives another should be taken into account. This way, in grammar and syntax lessons, it is possible to point constantly from one language to another, and this touches on a point that is exceedingly important for the students. They learn a subject far better if they have in their souls the method of applying it in a number of directions. <clears throat> you will be able to say to them, quote, Now you have spoken a German sentence and a Latin sentence. In a German sentence, if we are speaking of ourselves, we can hardly ever leave out the I capital. But in the Latin sentence, the I is contained in the verb. Unquote. You need not go any further. Indeed, it would not be good to go any further. But it is wise just to touch on this fact, so that the student gains a certain feeling for it then a force will emanate from this feeling that will work as a living faculty for understanding other elements of grammar. Please absorb this fact and think it over very deeply, that it is possible in a stimulating living lesson to develop capacities in the children that you need for teaching. This is indeed so. Say, for example, that you have touched upon something without pedantically enlarging on it. If you have said to the children, quote, Latin does not say I because it is included in the verb, but the German language does say it, unquote. then for a moment a faculty is awakened in the children that is otherwise not there. At this moment the faculty is awakened, and after this sense has awakened you can work at grammatical rules more easily with the children than if you had to draw on their ordinary state of soul. You will have to think how you can create the aptitudes you want for a certain lesson. <clears throat> the children need not have the full measure of capacities you intend to use, but you must have the skill to call to life such capacities that can later fade away again when the children leave the classroom. This technique can be applied specifically to the teaching of foreign languages in the following form. You first have the children read aloud, paying attention to proper pronunciation. Rather than giving too many pronunciation rules, you read a section and then let the children read after you. Then they retell the passage they have read, forming their own thoughts about it and expressing them in different languages. Quite separately, you teach the lessons on grammar and syntax with rules to be remembered and examples to be forgotten. There you have the framework of our language teaching. The end of Lecture 9